Nostalgia Anime Audiobook Presents Is It Wrong to Try to Pick Up Girls in a Dungeon? Written by Fujino Amori Volume 15 Intermission At the Hestia Familia home, after she updated his status, Hestia asked Bell what he'd done, as he'd gone up 3,400 points in total. She'd already heard about what happened, but upon hearing his answer that he'd almost died eight times, she told him to tell the other members that she'd do their status updates another day since she was tired. She thought that he could potentially rank up but decided to keep quiet about it when she thought about how the other gods would react, instead remarking that he'd grown a lot since they'd first met. Following his status update, Belle went on a walk through Orario with Welf. Lily wanted to go with him but had to go to the guild to report their expedition, though she told them to keep the fact that Bell went to the deep floors a secret to prevent their familiar rank from rising, which would mean that they'd have to accept the penalty for failing the expedition. Welf then asked him if he was having trouble sleeping because he'd heard him waking up in the middle of the night, worrying about his health. However, the topic caused Bell to let slip that Haruheim came to check on him holding his hand until he was able to sleep and reading hero stories with him, causing Welf to tell him to not mention that to Hestia or Lily. As they walked, people called out to them, whether they were fellow adventurers or normal townspeople. At that point, Bell saw a man he recognized, who had a guilty expression and tried to leave. Bell thanked him for the black bread, causing the man to be surprised, and the man told him to do his best. When Welf asked him about the man, Bell answered that he was someone he'd met before Hestia and Lily, and recalled memories of the past. Chapter 1 Years ago, when Bell lived with his grandfather, he was constantly told stories of Orario. His grandfather told him that he could find anything he wanted at Orario, though he could potentially get caught up in the times, leading his grandfather to tell him to go only if he had the resolve to do so. Several years later after his grandfather's death, Bell decided to head to Orario, asking a traveling merchant to take him along in his wagon. A while later, the two reached a hill with an excellent view of Orario, causing Bell to be so excited that he thanked the merchant and went off on his own. He eventually reached an entrance to Orario thirty minutes later and waited in line to be checked. As the guild member checked him for a fauna, the other guard remarked that Bell had a cute face, asking why he came to Orario, to which Bell answered that he was looking for an encounter in the dungeon. Hashana laughed at his answer but wished him luck. As he walked down the main street, Bell spotted a large group of people, learning that the Loki familia had come back from their latest expedition. While the man who explained it to him was surprised that he didn't know about the Loki familia, Bell's attention was captivated by Ace, following her with his eyes. He later paid 2,000 Valis to stay three nights in an inn while he searched for a familia to join, however he was rejected by all the familia he visited, forcing him to pay an additional 2,500 Valis to stay another three nights. After leaving the inn, he continued to search for a familia, though like before they all rejected him. Disheartened by the results, Bell remembered the real reason why he came to Orario. As he was about to walk into an alley, a voice called out to him, and upon turning around he saw a goddess looking at him. The goddess introduced herself as Hestia, revealing that she was looking for people to join her familia. Bell eagerly asked to join her familia, leading to the formation of the Hestia familia, and their life together began. Intermission One night, Hestia was talking with Haruheim in the Hestia Familia home's living room, the latter telling the former that they'd met Ween again. Hestia was jealous, prompting Haruheim to suggest for the goddess to sneak into the dungeon, though Hestia rejected her suggestion as she didn't know what Lily would do if they had to pay another fine. Hestia had come to like Haruheim, nevertheless she made sure to warn her to not try anything weird to Bell, especially at night. When Haruheim left to help Welf find the tea leaves, Hestia turned her attention to the center of the room where Lily and Makoto were playing shogi with Belle watching them, and remarked that the familia had become able to buy luxury items like tea and shogi compared to the past. 
She got up after a while and moved over to the fireplace to begin setting up kindling when Belle asked her what she was doing. When Hestia told him that she wanted to set up the fireplace, he remarked that she'd always wanted a house with a fireplace since she was the goddess of the hearth. The two began talking about various things, such as Hestia stating that she initially wanted a larger familia than Loki's, and that lately she'd been thinking that their previous home wasn't such a bad place after all. Belle offered to massage her shoulders and she agreed in exchange for him to promise to continue to be with her. As he massaged her shoulders, she remarked that a familia was a good thing, and recalled past memories while looking at the fire. Chapter 2 One night, Hestia came down from the heavens after sealing away her arcanum. She spotted the babble in the distance and asked a trader to take her to Ororio. Once she arrived, she went through the admittance process at the gate and entered the city. As she looked around for Hephaestus' place, she met Loki. Immediately, both sides were in a foul mood and began arguing between each other. Loki mocked Hestia and told her that someone like her wouldn't be able to be successful. While they argued, Lafia interrupted them and wondered who Hestia was. Loki told her that she didn't need to greet a useless goddess like her and instead should call her Dochibi. Hestia noticed Lafia and the others behind Loki and realized that they were Loki's familia members. Loki revealed that her familia was one of the strongest in Ororio, something which Hestia refused to believe. The two fought for a while before Loki mocked her and left. Later, Hestia complained about what happened with Loki to Hephaestus. Hephaestus agreed to take care of Hestia until she was able to manage things on her own. At that moment Tsubaki arrived, mentioning that she bought too much at a stall. Hestia wondered what it was and Tsubaki told her that it was food known as Jagamarukin. She ended up staying for three months at the Hephaestus familia home doing nothing, and one day Hephaestus finally kicked her out. Hestia, annoyed, decided to obtain a home and a familia to get back at Hephaestus. She tried recruiting an elf into the Hestia familia but was rejected after she failed to give any information about her familia. She ended up spending the night outside and went begging to Hephaestus the following morning. Hephaestus didn't really know what to do and ultimately ended up giving Hestia an old church to stay in, a job, and money. Three months later, Hestia still hadn't recruited anyone into the Hestia familia. After failing for the fiftieth time that day to recruit someone, she saw a human and decided to follow him around. She watched as he was rejected by multiple familias. Hestia noted that the human seemed to be lonely just like her and decided to call out to him, not knowing that it would be the start of everything to come. Intermission The day after Hestia updated Belle's Falna, she did the same to Lily's, announcing to the latter that she'd leveled up. Lily couldn't comprehend the news at first but then let out a cry of joy. Trying to stop herself from laughing, Hestia handed her the status sheet that listed her final level 1 stats, which included a new skill called Command Call. She was also able to choose between abnormal resistance and mixing as a potential development ability, and after some consideration, she chose abnormal resistance as she wanted to continue being Belle's supporter even if mixing could potentially save them some money. She was extremely happy about the praise she received, especially from Belle, who she recalled had been a target she tried to take advantage of. Putting the thought aside, she told him that she'd continue to support him. Despite failing their recent expedition, Lily was still happy because of her level up. She contemplated whether her rank up would raise the tax total they had to pay. Nevertheless she shrugged the thought away with her current good mood. On her way through the city, she encountered Luan, who was out buying supplies for the Palum's hidden tavern. As usual, he tried to insult her, but she ignored it due to her good mood and instead told him that she'd leveled up, shocking him. She saw her previous self in him, however she didn't console him instead telling him that she'd been through a lot and therefore it wasn't right for him to be envious. Knowing that she was right, he changed the topic, asking about the bag of money in her arms. Before she could answer, the elderly couple of the flower shop spotted and called out to her, 
causing her to use Cinderella to transform into an elf girl at a speed that impressed Luan. The elderly couple explained that they'd wronged Lily as they'd only been thinking of themselves and not of what she'd been going through, and felt guilty about it. The husband added that money had been left from time to time in front of their shop along with flowers he remembered telling Lily, were their favorite. When Juan asked why he didn't visit the Hestia Familia, the elderly couple answered that they didn't feel worthy of doing so. Not wanting them to be so negative, Lily offered to buy the leftover flowers with all of the money in the bag, her actions reminding them of her actual self. After the couple left, Juan asked her if it was all right if she didn't reveal herself, to which she answered that their guilt toward her was causing trouble for them and she planned to stop once she paid enough. She also claimed that she felt like she was still a weak Paolum, however Luan rejected her claim, telling her that she was strong, far stronger than himself. At the Soma Familia home, Soma stopped what he was doing and looked out the window, causing Chandra to ask if something was wrong. He explained that he felt that she had gotten stronger, which Chandra realized was Lily, and he asked if Soma planned on going out to meet her, to which Soma answered that he felt that he wasn't worthy of doing so since he'd abandoned Lily once before. However, once he was alone, he congratulated Lily as he continued to look out the window, remarking that she'd grown. Chapter 3 Lily was born 15 years ago at the time when the Zeus Familia failed to defeat the one-eyed black dragon. The order within Orario declined due to the weakening of the Zeus Familia, giving rise to Evelis. During this time, the Freya Familia and the Loki Familia drove them out to become the new hope of Orario. At the age of three, Lily learned how to beg. Her parents ordered her to stand all day and beg for money from passing people. They had been touched by the power of the Soma and did anything they could to taste it again. A while later, Lily learned that her parents had died in the dungeon. She was too young to know what sadness was but she knew that she was now alone. One day, while looking for food, Lily met Soma in a hallway within the Soma Familia home. She felt her status throb, causing her to hide around the corner. At the same time, her stomach sounded and Soma gave her a jagamarukin. He then entered his room with Lily following behind. Soma gave the rest of the jagamarukin except for one for himself and began working on the plants. Hearing the sound of the plants, Lily fell asleep, feeling Soma carry her to her bed. That was the first time Lily felt kindness and last time she felt Soma's warmth. When she became six, while spending every day going to Soma's room, Xanus had all familia members assemble. Xanus declared that as the new captain, he would lead the Soma familia instead of Soma. Some members muttered that he murdered the captain candidate to attain that position. Xanus snapped his fingers and a cup of Soma was handed to every familia member present. He claimed that it was a gift from Soma but they knew that he stole it from the storehouse. However, they were captivated by its scent, their mouths moving to the edge of the cup. As Lily drank the Soma, she lost all sense of reason. From that moment on, Lily no longer visited Soma's room, instead heading to the dungeon to gather money so that she could drink the Soma again. She didn't realize that Soma looked down at her from above with a look of disappointment and despair, at her becoming one that desperately wanted the Soma. Soma lost interest in his familia after they all fell under Xanus' control due to the Soma. The familia essentially became something to provide for Xanus once though the familia members were too influenced by the Soma to realize that. Lily tried her best as an adventurer, though eventually her limit came, forcing her to become a supporter instead. As a supporter, adventurers abused her. Even though her share was less than normal, Adventurers blamed her for mistakes she never made and forced her to work for free, once even taking weapons and potions that she used for herself. One time at a bar, as she begged for her share, an adventurer kicked her then threw her a piece of chicken with barely anything left, laughing with his companions as she ate it. She cried every day at the treatment she received as the Soma's influence over her disappeared around the same time. Other members within the Soma Familia started to take money from her. 
Lily even forgot her memories of the time she spent with Soma. One day, she decided to run away from the Soma familia, living and working at a flower shop owned by an elderly couple. However, some members of the Soma familia tracked her down, wrecking the flower shop, beat the husband, and stole any money within the store. The couple rejected Lily, telling her that they wished they had never met her. Following this incident, something within her broke, and from that day on the light in her eyes began to die. Lily continued to be a supporter, acting as the adventurer's obedient puppet. Around the same time, she began stealing from others, no longer able to believe in justice. The others began taking money from her even more. One day, Canoe stole from Lily, complaining about the little amount she had on her. Xanus watched from the side but didn't try to help. Instead, he bent down and asked Lily if she was saving up for something as he knew that she hadn't drunk any Soma. Xanus used the Soma every so often to keep the familia members, under its influence though she didn't drink it out of her hate and fear of Soma. She didn't answer him, causing Canoe to kick her to get her to answer. Canoe suggesting selling her to a brothel, However at that moment Chandra appeared and warned them against it. Kanu accused him of protecting Lily but Chandra pointed out that selling someone with a fauna from a different familia to a brothel could be seen as spying, bring the possibility of facing the wrath of the Ishtar familia. Kanu and his companions faltered yet Xanus continued to look down at her. Xanus agreed with Chandra, deciding to keep Lily so she could serve the familia. Lily could do nothing except clench her fists, vowing revenge on adventurers. Once she became thirteen, she started using Cinder Ella which appeared in her status half a year earlier. Transforming herself into an elf girl, she stole from adventurers, laughing as she heard their angry voices. While she could have lived a different life using her magic, her thirst for revenge against adventurers refused to let her do that. Ever since then, Lily began stealing from adventurers more frequently. She would lead adventurers into traps within the dungeon, steal anything worth something, then run away as fast as she could. The angry adventurers would run after her, however her magic enabled her to evade them. Lily felt an empty feeling along with her happiness at tricking adventurers though she got rid of those thoughts, reminding herself of the abuse she received over the years. A couple years later, in a room she used, she remembered a story she had read while looking at a mirror. It was the story of an ash-covered girl that was transformed into a beautiful woman. The girl then attended the prince's party though she ran when the magic disappeared. However, the prince came to get her, and the two ended up together in a happy life. Lily brushed off her thoughts as foolish. Soon after, Lily set her sights on Belle. She laughed at his reason for protecting her from Ged, deeming his reason of, because she's a girl, as foolish. She could tell that he had recently come to Orario and knew he was too nice for his own good. Lily decided to teach him a lesson with the Hestia knife as payment. She wanted to make him miserable just like herself, wanting to make sure he never said, because she's a girl, ever again. Filled with those thoughts, she approached Belle for the first time to become his supporter. Intermission. At the guild, Ina was shocked to hear the truth of the expedition from Belle, overwhelmed by everything that had happened to him during it. She was shocked once again when Belle reported that his highest stat was at B, convincing her that her report on Belle would once again not see the light of day. She ordered him to stand and then hugged him, thanking him for coming back as she'd seen a lot of adventurers never come back, recalling her first adventurer. However, Ina eventually realized that her breasts were resting on Belle's cast, causing her to immediately separate herself from him out of embarrassment. Red-faced, Ina tried to leave with the excuse of getting documents about the 50th floor in case he ever dropped down there, but before she could leave, he stopped her bowing and thanking her for the information that had saved his life in the deep floors. After leaving the conference room, Ina returned to her desk when Rose called her over. Rose pulled out a jar full of valis from under her desk, reminding Ina that the money was from the bet they'd done to see if Belle would last half a year. 
she thought that a good girl like Ina wouldn't accept the money, nevertheless Ina accepted the money with a fake smile on her face, announcing to the room that she would go to dinner with Belle using said money. Everyone in the room was shocked and a number of male employees fell out of their chairs. Rose and Sophie tried to talk her out of it but she refused, stating that it she'd use it to apologize to Belle for betting on him. Before she left the room, she told the employees that she was Belle's advisor. Chapter 4 One spring when Ina was 14 years old, she joined the guild. Ina along with Misha were taken by their superior to meet other guild workers. The main reason Ina chose to work at the guild was because of money. The salary of a guild employee sometimes went above that of a low-leveled adventurer. Ina herself wasn't that interested in the money, she sent most of it to her family. Her mother Anatul was from the High Elf Forest which she left along with Reveria Joe's Elf. However, the air outside the forest seemed detrimental to her health as she quickly became sick. Ina's loving father took care of her and her younger sister by working as hard as he could. To pay her family back for their care, Ina decided to join the school. She worked hard, ultimately earning the recommendation to join the guild. Ina's first job was as an advisor. She was assigned Maris Hackard, a new adventurer. Maris herself was displeased that Ina was her advisor as she wanted an old dwarf instead. The two didn't get along that well and argued with each other. That night, Ina complained to Misha about Maris. Misha felt sorry for Ina and decided to tell her about her own assigned adventurer. When she mentioned that her adventurer was cool, Ina made sure to remind her to keep her personal feelings out of work. Misha liked to talk, continuing to talk about various things such as their meeting with Arenas and about their fellow co-workers. She then became worried if she could do her job properly. Ina and Misha were often seen as a set since school with Misha only joining the guild because Ina was going to. Ina comforted her and assured her that she could do her job properly. Ina steadily worked at the guild while experiencing many things. She was especially surprised at how fast Maris was going through the dungeon. One afternoon a year later, Maris reported to Ina that she reached the tenth floor. Ina reminded her that she was ignoring her words by heading to the tenth floor already. Maris brushed all of that off and invited Ina to go drink with her. Ina tried to reject her offer, wanting to separate her work from her personal life, but Maris wouldn't have it. While at the bar, Maris apologized to her for her actions a year earlier, telling her that she was an awesome advisor. Ina asked her why she wanted to become an adventurer and Maris told her it was so that she could show up her parents, that abandoned her and to give back to the god that picked her up. A month later, Ina was approached by her superior Remmer. Remmer asked how Ina was faring in her new life as a guild worker. She told him that she was doing well, mentioning that she was starting to become close with her assigned adventurers. Remmer became silent after hearing that and commented that Ina and Misha still hadn't experienced it. He advised her to not get close to her assigned adventurers as it would be hard on her later. Ina stood still in the hall while Remmer left her alone. Several days later, Ina was part of a group inspecting the babble. As they were about to leave, they saw a group of people bringing back bodies of dead adventurers from the dungeon. She was shocked to recognize one of the bodies as that of Maris. The other adventurers judged from the wounds that Maris' party was attacked by an infant dragon. Ina tried to get away from the fact of Maris' death by closing her eyes but her mind pictured her dead body. Ina was faced with the death of someone close to her for the first time. As if Maris' death was the beginning, the four other adventurers Ina was assigned also died. She began to blame herself for their deaths, wondering if there was something she could have done. Her fellow co-worker Rose told her to just endure it. There were other jobs that they could have done and that it was their own fault that they died. Although Rose spoke like she was annoyed, Ina could see that there was also sadness in her expression. Days later, Ina and Misha comforted each other in a room. Misha's assigned adventurer had also died. 
the two held sat together as they cried. Soon after, unlike her fellow co-workers, Ina didn't get away from becoming close to her adventurers. She made sure to instruct the adventurers assigned to her, such as Dormal and Luvis, about the various things in the dungeon. Misha started to ask her for advice and Ina herself began to get over the deaths of her assigned adventurers. Four years later, Ina met Bell Cranel. She finished his registration and told him to come back the next day. In the office, Rose, who had been watching, commented that Bell would die fast as an adventurer. Ina tried to protest but she knew what Rose was saying was true. Rose asked his preferences and Ina told her that it was an elf. Rose asked her co-worker Sophie if she wanted to be his advisor, however she refused to be the advisor of an adventurer that would die fast. Ina protested their decision though Rose asked the others if they wanted to bet on how long Belle would survive. At this point she became angry at her fellow co-workers, deciding to take Belle as her own assigned adventurer. Ina made the others promise to stop betting if Belle survived for more than a year. The next morning, Ina remembered the words she said earlier, knowing she had gotten too passionate. However, she remembered Maris and decided to give it all she had. Ina entered the room Belle was waiting in and greeted him. Intermission. Welf had his status updated the same day that Lily had hers done. In addition to gaining more status points, he gained a new skill called Veritas Burn. Instead of being happy about these achievements, Welf was concerned about other things, and he brought his new unbreakable magic sword to Hephaestus at the branch store in northwestern Orario. Welf was silent as Hephaestus looked the weapon over. He wasn't certain that he'd get a favorable response but at the same time he could simply try harder if she didn't like it. Tsubaki, who was also in the room, repeated what she'd reported to Hephaestus earlier about how Welf had smithied it in the dungeon with barely any tools. Eventually, Hephaestus announced that it was so-so, which Welf was happy about since it meant that he'd improved. Once she returned the sword to him, she became red-faced and offered to acknowledge him a little, and was partway through her offer of starting a relationship with him before Welf interrupted her. Unfortunately, Welf had misunderstood her, not realizing what Hephaestus was trying to say and instead vowed to make a sword that she'd acknowledge, and immediately left. He believed that Hephaestus was trying to tell him to not be satisfied with where he was at now and to continue reaching new heights. Hephaestus herself was angry and embarrassed that he had been completely oblivious to her feelings. After leaving the branch store, Welf let his happiness explode, overjoyed over the so-so remark from Hephaestus. He'd hated magic swords ever since he'd been able to smith them but he felt like he could love them a little now. When he reached Central Park, he looked up at the sky, wondering if Phobos was watching and mentioned that he was doing fine. Chapter 5 as a child, Welf hated parties due to the insults that he would always receive. The party that he was currently attending was no exception, a boy around his age from a powerful family insulting him for being a Kratzo. He especially didn't like parties as none of it was true. Even if people acted friendly toward one another, on the inside they were always trying to gain the upper hand over others. However, Marius came to his aid, chastising the boy that was insulting him. Even though he was currently only twelve years old, Marius was already. The boy was startled for a moment but then began explaining to Marius that it was all Welf's fault for coming to the party, even going as far to mention that it was Welf that picked a fight with them without realizing his place. Welf ignored his insults though he couldn't control himself and punched the boy when he insulted metalworking by calling it, playing with metal. The boy's two friends joined the fight while Marius did nothing to stop Welf as he was too busy trying to hide his laughter. The next day, Welf was in the back garden with Phobos, who was having a fit of laughter after hearing what he did the night before. Welf's mother was busy looking for him within the mansion so he hid out here to avoid a lecture. She remarked that it would be far more interesting if the Kratzo family was made up of people like Welf. Phobos was the goddess of her own familia that was absorbed by Rakia following their defeat. 
Reikia contained a massive amount of soldiers which made it impossible for Ares to take care of all of them himself. Well fast if Phobos thought about doing a coup against Ares but she was too lazy to train soldiers while evading Ares' watch. On top of that, all level 2 and 3 soldiers were directly under Ares' control, and if any person was skilled enough, they would immediately be inducted into the Ares' familia. Phobos then remembered that Garen mentioned they would be forging that day, causing Welf to run off in search of them. Although the forge was old like the mansion, Welf liked it there. As he greeted Garen and Vil by calling them old man and dad, Vil scolded him, wondering when he would start acting like a noble, continuing on to lecturing him about his fight the night before. Welf tried to protest but his father wouldn't have any of it pointing out that it was only because of Marius that he got out of any trouble. Before his father could say anything else, Garen silenced him. Welf watched his grandfather Smith for a while until he told Welf to try it. He was elated as this was the first time he had ever been able to start smithing. While he smithied, he never thought that his dream of making a weapon better than the Kratzo magic sword with his grandfather and father would never happen. The fateful day came on Welf's tenth birthday. On that day, Welf received the Falna from Phobos. Garen had made him wait until his tenth birthday so that he could learn the effort it took to smith before that. Once she finished, Phobos and the other Kratzos stared at the skill Kratzo blood listed on his back. Getting an idea, Phobos told Welf to make a magic sword. He pointed out that he couldn't make one since the Kratzos were cursed but nonetheless he still made one. Once the magic sword was finished, Welf and the others went out to the grasslands to test it. Everyone was amazed at its power which completely burned the grass around them. While the others were elated, Welf himself was saddened by the result. Once they returned to their mansion, Welf's family surrounded him, telling him to make the Kratzo magic sword to restore their honor. Welf was opposed to it and refused to make it, causing his father to punch him. When Welf asked him about their dream to make a weapon better than the Kratzo magic sword, he told him to stop talking nonsense and called him a fool. He tried to gain support from the silent Garen though Garen told him to make the magic sword. That day, Welf completely cut any ties with the rest of his family. That night, as Welf was preparing to escape, Phobos visited his room. Phobos apologized for the whole situation and offered to help him escape Rakia. She told him to take the second magic sword he created, the one that was going to be offered to the king. Welf agreed to her help and they decided to escape the next day. At the throne room, Ares told Martinus that someone that could make the Kratzo magic sword had appeared. Martinus wasn't fully convinced of its effective, warning Ares that it might break just like when the spirits first cursed them. Marius watched them from the side and asked the spy for more information about it. Upon hearing the name, Marius remembered him from the party a year ago. However, he still ordered for knights to be positioned at the wall. The following night, Welf commenced with his escape. Valua had a total of four walls that separated the royalty and nobility, the military, the people, and the outside. Welf had easily passed the first two walls thanks to Phobos though he had been spotted at the third one. At the fourth wall, he saw that the gate was closed and knights were guarding it. He knew he had no chance if he attacked head-on. Welf used the magic sword he had, completely destroying the gate and seriously wounding the knights. As he passed through the destroyed gate, he questioned creating magic swords. Welf reached a wooded area not far from Valua. Once he arrived, Phobos appeared from within. She updated his status and also modified it so that he could convert to any familia that he wanted to. She pointed out that her blood would still be there, which she equated to having taken his first time, causing Welf to tell her not to say weird things. Phobos informed him that she would take the blame for the whole thing and knowing Ares, he would believe it as he was an idiot. She was also going to do it for Welf and the fact that she was getting tired of working for Ares. Phobos said her goodbyes to Welf and left him alone. Days later, a pillar of light shone from the direction of Valua. 
Welf sat on a hill and cried as he watched it. A while later, Hephaestus visited the sword-smithing city of Zolingen. While there, she noticed Welf fighting with other smiths for a spot. The head apologized for showing her the site but she told him that smiths were like that. She then asked for information about him with the head telling her that Welf came a while ago, wanting to work. Hephaestus waited until Welf finished smithing a sword before she approached him. She asked for his name, then invited him to join the Hephaestus familia. However, Welf wanted Hephaestus to name herself before she tried to invite him. Smiling, Hephaestus named herself. Intermission at the hostess of fertility, the Hestia, Mayak, and Takamikazuchi familias celebrated the removal of Bell's cast, having already celebrated the expedition earlier at the Hestia familia home. Only the familia members were there as Hestia had work and so the gods, which included her, Takamikazuchi, Mayak, Hephaestus, Hermes, and Demeter, would have their own celebration. As they ate, drank, and talked, Bell looked around wondering if the Loki familia was there. When Welf noticed him looking around, he claimed that he wondered if the Loki familia would fit, prompting Welf to tell him not to worry as Allegia was coming up. Before he could ask Welf about Allegia, Cassandra interrupted, asking Bell about his arm. After he showed her that his arm was fine, he thanked them for the Goliath robe, as he definitely would have died without it. The topic shifted to level ups with the members congratulating Lily, Daphne, and Cassandra on their level-ups. At that point Anya and Chloe tried to brag about their contribution in helping Belle, but Lunwar pointed out that they showed up after things were finished. Mia intimidated the two to getting back to work, and Sir came over, partly to tell him to not feel bad about Anya and Chloe getting yelled at and partly to interrogate him about his relationship with Ryu because the latter had seemingly been avoiding him as of late. Belle immediately began sweating and wondered what to do, with Seer directing his attention to Ryu, who'd been working but unnaturally avoiding looking in Belle's direction, swiftly turning around every time he came close to appearing in her line of sight. Even when Mia ordered her to take stuff to Belle's table, he wasn't able to have a proper conversation with her. Due to this, Bell attracted the attention of the others at his table, including Lily, who began interrogating him on the same topic. He ran through his memory, trying to think of how he'd made Ryu angry, and wondered if he'd misunderstood when he thought they'd been able to know each other better. Soon after, Seer lightly hit his head with the wooden tray and went back to work, with Bell noticing that she seemed to be angry which was unusual for her. Around the table the other members had varying reactions to the news, some of them seemingly realizing what it meant. Later on, when Ryu went out back to throw out the trash, she reflected over her actions, vowing to apologize to Belle. She knew that she only needed to apologize, however, for some reason she couldn't bring herself to do it, feeling nervous and acting unusual, causing her to wonder what was wrong with her. Before she could wonder when she started referring to him as Belle, she heard him call out to her from behind, however, the fact that she was alone with him caused her mind to scramble and not be able to process this scenario, causing her to attack him. Belle stopped her attack by grabbing her wrist with his right hand, but this caused Rhea's body to heat up and become red-faced, leading to her throwing him. As she realized that she'd thrown him at full force and felt guilty about it, she heard Anya's angry voice asking why she was taking so long in taking out the trash. Ryu's influenced feelings won over logic once again, causing her to immediately flee the area while Princess carrying the unconscious bell. Ryu fled through the city, eventually coming to a stop in a narrow alleyway. Once she put him down on a bench she reflected over her actions again, panicking and casting unnecessary healing magic on him eventually ending up giving him a lap pillow, and became embarrassed when she realized what she was doing. As she tried to tell herself that she was simply preventing Belle from having a sore neck, two drunk beast humans saw her and began teasing her, though she immediately intimidated them and threatened them to forget what they saw. After they left, Ryu continued to remark that there was something wrong with her, believing that she was just as bad as she was before. 
just touching his hair caused her chest to go crazy. Just as she was about to explain why she didn't hate him, she realized he was awake, telling him to wake up. The two cleared any misunderstandings they had and then began talking about what had happened after they came back. Eventually, he asked her if she'd tell him about the Astria Familia, and she agreed to his request. Chapter 6 In the forest of Ryumiliwa that she lived in, Ryu was the member of a family that cared for the sacred tree. Because of this, ever since she was born, she received combat training. Even if they didn't have the fauna, they were still capable of driving off monsters on the surface using swords or bows and arrows. One day, Ryu and her fellow family members drove off a group of merchants from entering their forest. Once they returned home, the adults mocked them, calling them dirty and ugly. As time passed, she began to think that beautiful elves were the ugliest of all people. No matter how much she tried to forget it, once she began thinking about it, the thought firmly planted itself in her mind. Eventually, Ryu decided to leave the elven forest, taking with her some zeros or to have some money on hand. Once she left the forest, she made her way to Orario, thinking that she could make friends where every race mingled together. However, even there she continued to reject people. She could have tried to get help from other elves but her thoughts prevented her from doing so. Ryu began wearing clothes that covered her whole body along with a mask. As time passed, she began to believe that she was looking down on others, just like the others in her home forest because of how she was rejecting them. While she stood alone in an alley in the rain, a voice called out to her from behind. Turning around, she knew that the person was a goddess. Ryu was apprehensive of gods, as when she first came to Orario a certain goddess and others exhibited behavior that appalled her. When Astria mentioned that she looked lost, Ryu's anger exploded, blaming the gods for creating elves. Astria accepted her anger without saying anything. After listening to her, she told Ryu that what she needed was a friend that she could see as an equal, not a god. Astria handed her a map to her home along with some food and left. Ryu began to think that the liveliness in Orario lacked something definite. The public order within Orario was somewhat lacking, with fights and problems occurring across the city. Two days after meeting Astria, Jura and his group surrounded Ryu in an alley, knowing that she wasn't connected to any god. They planned to sell her off to a brothel though their plans were ruined by the arrival of Elise who quickly sent them running. Elise managed to convince Ryu to trust her and took her to her familia's home. Elise led Ryu to the Astria Familia home. While there, Elise explained that the Astria Familia was not only an exploration-type familia but also acted to keep order within Orario, the Freya Familia, Loki Familia, Ganesha Familia, and the Hephaestus Familia were still growing, though she declared that they would rise to help end all of these problems. As the others watched, Elise told Ryu that they needed companions to help achieve this goal and asked Ryu if she would join them. Ryu agreed to join the Astria Familia and was given the Fauna. Once she joined, the members of the Familia gathered in a circle and they swore on their Familia emblem that they would bring peace to Orario a promise that wouldn't be broken until five years later. Intermission Mikoto and Haruheim had their statuses updated by Hestia. Mikoto and Haruheim both gained a new skill, however Hestia didn't add Mikoto's, stating that it scared her because it appeared to be a self-sacrifice skill. Later on, Bell, Lily, Welf, and Haruheim ventured to the third floor of the dungeon to have the latter practice combat by fighting goblins with a staff. Because of her lack of experience, Haruheim failed miserably, tripping during her attack and allowing a group of goblins to beat her up, forcing Lily to save her. Lily had volunteered to be in charge of Haruheim's experience gain, though she also enjoyed beating up monsters that had caused problems for her as a level one. As they watched, Welf remarked that Haruheim didn't seem to be improving at all, having already tried swords, spears, and other weapons. At that point, Aisha, who'd come to watch Haruheim practice, 
told them that it'd be beneficial for Haruheim to practice chanting instead as she didn't have what it took to use weapons. Belle and Welf tried to argue that it'd be beneficial to keep practicing, prompting her to tell them that those affected by Yukai no Kazuchi gained less than half the experience a normal adventurer would've gained from the monster, causing the two to be surprised as they never considered it. Aisha had also advised the Hestia Familia to not have Haruheim level up, citing the fact that she lacked both combat experience and experience as a sorcerer. Because of this, only Belle, Welf, and Makoto knew that Haruheim could level up. They didn't tell Haruheim so she wouldn't be pressured as much and they didn't tell Lily so she could feel good about leveling up. Although Aisha acknowledged Haruheim's chanting, she wouldn't consider her to be fully fledged until she could handle things on her own in combat. Off to the side, Makoto had been listening to their conversation, and was adamant that Haruheim would soon be able to learn how to defend herself. True to her word, Haruheim successfully dealt with a goblin's attack and landed a blow to it with her staff, surprising everyone there. As she smiled, Makoto recalled how much Haruheim had grown since they'd first met in the Far East. Chapter 7 Ten years ago, Makoto and the others brought Haruheim to the shrine to meet with Takame Kazuchi and the other gods, who thanked her for her consideration. When Haruheim had learned about the shrine, she had asked her father to send food to help them. As the other children crowded around Haruheim to play with her, Makoto went over to Tsukuyumi instead asking her why Haruheim didn't seem to be happy, to which the goddess answered that she probably felt guilty for having a blessed life compared to the poor orphans. Makoto was shocked, worried that she'd made it difficult for Haruheim. Nevertheless Tsukuyumi added that it was Haruheim's kindness and weakness, and therefore Makoto and the others should protect her. From that day on, Haruheim frequently visited the shrine to play and help. Ten years later, Makoto had been surprised when Haruheim announced that she'd work as a maid in the Hestia Familia. Makoto offered to have her work split among the members of the Familia, nevertheless, she refused, stating that people had always taken care of her, so she'd repay the favor and that she wanted to become independent. However, contrary to Makoto's high expectations, Haruheim kept on failing her job as a maid. Seeing this, Welf asked Haruheim if there was anything she was good at, prompting her to offer to use techniques she'd learned as a prostitute in training, though she pleaded to him to allow her to spend a night with Belle first. Welf naturally refused as he was only interested in Hephaestus, regardless. Hestia and Lily misunderstood the situation and accused him of asking Haruheim to perform sexual services. Despite Haruheim's countless mistakes, Makoto was surprised that her spirit never broke. After thinking of what she could do to help, Makoto asked Belle to teach Haruheim how to be a better maid, since working together with the man she loved would make Haruheim try to look good in front of him. A month later, Haruheim had gotten better at her job despite her mistakes, which had stemmed from her experience from being with Ween. She had become vigorous about working and had started learning how to be a supporter from Lily. Around the time of the Hestia Familia's first expedition, Lily had grown to trust Haruheim with work, and after the expedition Makoto felt like Lily was training Haruheim as her successor in case something happened. Makoto had also seen Haruheim practice her magic with Aisha in the home's library and martial arts with Takuma Kazuchi. Her efforts eventually paid off during the battle with the Amphispina. Sometime after he returned from the expedition, Bell woke up during the night, moving his hand to his waist as if to pull out his knife. Following the expedition, he'd been having trouble sleeping, being reminded of what had happened in his dreams. Soon after, Haruheim knocked on his door, offering to read him hero stories to help him sleep. On the other side of Bell's door, Makoto was also listening to the stories, having woken up and followed Haruheim who'd snuck out of their room. She spotted a half-awake Hestia, who planned on sleeping with Belle to comfort him, and tricked her into returning to her own room to prevent her from bothering Belle and Haruheim. As she guided Hestia back to her room, she hoped that she'd be able to continue to support Haruheim. Epilogue In the dungeon, an adventurer, Edgar, 
asked Bell if he would take revenge for his dead comrade Celia. The adventurer was holding his dead comrade, a female adventurer, in his hands. The adventurer and his party glared at the passageway where two eyes stared back at them. Bell assumed that they had run into an irregular situation in the dungeon and tried to escape, at which point Bell's party assisted them in running away. The adventurer knew that he was wrong in holding a grudge against the monster, but nevertheless pleaded for him to defeat it. As the woman died, Bell saw the man cry, which stunned him and caused his mind to go blank. However, he knew he had to defeat the monster, and as Lily, Welf, Makoto, and Haruheim watched, he ran off to confront the monster. Because of the dungeon, countless people died in Orario. However, if one looked at it from the monster's point of view, they were being massacred just for the adventurer's greed. While humans refused to admit this, it would be assumed that at least the gods would think of it. Everything had been decided the moment the monsters appeared from the dungeon and began attacking the lower world. If all of the pain stemmed from the monsters coming out of the dungeon, Ace tended to believe that the monsters should bear the hate and anger of the people. The area dark around her, Ace heard voices. Some sounded like voices of those she knew while others she didn't know. Countless hands reached out from the darkness while pleading to her. She knew that they were the voices of those that had passed, and that they were also the wishes of those in the future. A young ace looked down at her palm and slowly nodded. Just like others had done before, she decided to show her resolve through her weapon. At that point, her dream ended and Ace awoke. Looking around, she realized that she had fallen asleep in her own room after returning from getting her weapon maintained. Seeing Desperate, her sword, and a washcloth, she recalled the memories from her dream. She recalled that she had accepted those hands as if that was all she knew how to do. Ace got up from her bed, put Desperate back in its sheath, and was about to close her window when she noticed that Aurorio was dark. After looking out across the city for a few moments, she realized that it was Allegia, which led her to believe that it was the reason she had such a dream. Belle and the others returned to the surface once the monster had been killed. Despite having killed the monster, he had no feeling of having taken revenge or a sense of a mission. He believed that he wanted to stop any more sadness from occurring. Once he had defeated the monster, the adventurer that had asked him to do so thanked him with a tear-stained face. On the way back to the surface, the Hestia Familia helped the adventurers carry the dead adventurer's body to the surface. When they reached the surface, the adventurer sat next to the body and stopped moving. Some adventurers passing by casted glances of various emotions in their direction. Eventually, Lily and the others encouraged Belle to leave the body as there was nothing else they could do. As they left Babel, Belle noticed decorations across Central Park. Wooden pillars had been erected across the area with strings attached between them to hang banners and flowers. Additionally, all magic stone lamps had been turned off and small candles were being used in their place. Lily and Welf remembered that the day was Allegia causing a confused Bell to ask them what it was about. The other four members of his party explained to him that Allegia was a day to mourn dead heroes that fought monsters in ancient times, and was also a celebration to praise the efforts of those heroes. As Bell watched, Lily added that people dressed in white would go around visiting each of the monuments to the heroes, finally coming back to Central Park to sing elegies. The Allegia would continue until sunrise the next day. Seeing the light from the candles, Ace left the Loki Familia to walk around, troubled by the dream she had earlier. Instead of her usual clothes she wore a white one-piece and tied her hair on the back of her head. Walking along the edge of the street against the flow of people, the lights made her recall the faces of those she had parted with, some of which were former members of the Loki Familia. 
Remembering their deaths brought back the pain she felt when they died. While some people might think that adventurers should leave the dungeon if they were scared of losing others, Ace knew that it wasn't as simple as that. She had a reason she needed to fight, and while there may be ambitions or desires involved, adventurers were depended upon. As she was lost in thought, several children came running up to her. The children were excited that they were talking with the sword princess until a half-elf child asked Ace to defeat the one-eyed black dragon. Once the children left, Ace reflected over what she had been asked to do. She knew that adventurers had the responsibility of killing the dragon which was dangerous enough to be known as the living end. At that point, the sound of the elegies reached her ears, making her remember that the world wished for a hero. Recalling the children's hopeful expressions, she commented that she was afraid of looking at the children, and hearing the elegies made her heart hurt inside. Ace had her own desire, which was something different than what the world desired. She knew that when the time came she would fight for her own personal grudge, ending up as a foolish puppet bound to her own desire, rather than a hero for the people. Ace silently told herself that she couldn't be anyone's hero. Hearing the elegies, Belle stopped, causing Lily to ask if something was wrong. Belle pointed out that the gods were also singing, noting the songs of Loki, Freya, Ganesha, Hermes, Hephaestus, and Hestia. Hearing the songs caused him to recall the various things his grandfather had told him about the dungeon. He thought he finally understood the words his grandfather said. Belle expressed his desire to become a hero but also felt sorrow. The boy decided to offer flowers in order to remember the events that happened during the Elegia, while the girl decided to offer flowers to not lose sight of herself. Later, as the sun rose, Belle visited the first graveyard to offer flowers at Celia's grave. When he visited the Delling Familia's home, Edgar had informed him that she had been buried in the first graveyard, so he bought flowers at the elderly couple's shop and went there. The sight of the countless white graves made him think deeply about death. After leaving flowers that he had bought at a certain flower shop, Bell recalled that it was his second time visiting the first graveyard, as the first time was back when he first came to Orario. As he looked at the monuments commemorating the heroes of old, he sensed someone and turned around to see Ace unknowingly walking in his direction. Bell mentioned her name, and she noticed for the first time, surprised that he was there. Sunlight shone down on them, and he thought he saw that she was crying. The two had a brief conversation, with her asking if he came to leave flowers, before she herself left flowers at a certain monument and closed her eyes. It was silent for a while until she said, goodbye, to him and left. He tried to call out to her but couldn't bring himself to do it, and watched her walk away. He then moved in front of a monument she'd left flowers at, which was the monument of the hero Albert. As he read Albert's name, he immediately recalled the various names that he had been referred to by, finally remembering his alias of mercenary King Waldstein. Bell noticed the similarity between the name Waldstein and Wallenstein, suspicions growing in his heart that Ace might have a connection to Albert. He turned around and watched as Ace disappeared into the morning light. And that is the end of this volume. If you like my work, please leave a comment, I would love to hear from you. I would really appreciate it. Please like, share, and subscribe. Thank you for listening.